the, the motions of, of the uh, heavens very, very well. Um, the, uh, in this picture, the galactic center has only been determined within the last 60 years or so. Uh, mm. When you actually look at the galaxy in the night sky, it's very difficult to discern any portion of it that's more dense than the rest of it. Because we're in the disk and there's all this dust and gas in our galaxy that obscures the light that's coming from behind it. So, in general, um, the Milky Way has kind of the same appearance all throughout. So it's kind of doubtful that the Maya would have thought it, you know, significant that it was in this position. They may have thought it was significant that it was in the mid-plane of the galaxy. It has all of these um, dark patches throughout it. And the Maya conceived of the Milky Way actually as a pathway, a roadway, that actually leads to the underworld, to Baba. That, um, that was the path that dead souls take as they um, move on to the underworld, is that they, they went through there. So it's possible that the sun being in that part of the um, Milky Way may have been significant to them, but just what it meant, we don't really know. Um, I should say that the coincidence of the sun being there and the solstice is also not particularly rare. This band is kind of thick, and for about a 400 year period, um, every one of those 25,000 year cycles, the sun would be somewhere in that band during the winter solstice. And then outside of that time, okay, it won't occur with the solstice. And I, I'm sorry, I should have brought my globe. It's always useful to talk about what causes that 25,000 year cycle. If you think about a top, when a top is spinning, the top starts to wobble Whoa. like so. And this is a motion that physicists call precession. Mm -hmm. And the Earth does this, mm -hmm. because the Earth is like a spinning top. Mm -hmm. And it wobbles around just like this with a 25,000 year cycle. Mm -hmm. And what that acts to do is basically change the date of alignments with the sun and the stars. Right. Now, one of the things I would point out is now, one of the things we now know about the galaxy that we've studied it with modern telescopes in space and on the ground, is that these dark patches in the galaxy are um, actually clouds of dust and gas themselves where new stars are being born. So this is actually an image of the galaxy. It's the same as the one you just saw, but taken in infrared light. Mm -hmm. So this is visible light where those dark clouds are basically very dense clouds where new stars are inside being born. And then in infrared light, they can actually see into the clouds themselves and see the, the places where new stars are born. So it's actually kind of not a roadway to death, but it's a roadway to new life. Mm -hmm. Planetary alignments. That's the other thing you often hear about. Actually, this is in the last like 12 months or so, every time I mention anyone I'm an astronomer, this is the first thing I hear. Oh, I heard there's going to be a planetary alignment in 2012. I have heard and this picture I picked out, you know, this is kind of the typical textbook picture you'll see to talk about the solar system, but it kind of illustrates this idea of what people, I think, have in their mind when they say planetary alignment. <laughs> All the planets <laughs> lined up in a straight line. Well, I, you know, it's kind of a fun picture, but the reality of it is that this, in fact, never happens in the solar no. system. And it's, it's kind of impossible for all the planets to ever be in that configuration. Over time, there are certain resonances that have been set up in our solar system so that planets won't be in that uh, arrangement. Um, this is the actual arrangement of the planets on December 21st of 2012. There's really not much there in the way of any kind of alignment. But even if there were, even if the planets did do this, there isn't really anything that, that, that would result as a, because of this. Um, the gravity of the planets is not any stronger when they're in this configuration versus any other time in the solar system. And the gravity of the planets is really utterly insignificant to Earth. Um, the most important gravitational bodies for Earth are the moon and the sun. And it's the moon because it's so close to us, and the sun because it's so enormous. The other planets, really, if you compare their gravitational effects on Earth, they are hundreds of millions of times weaker than the influence of the 
moon and the earth, then the, or the moon and the sun, and the moon's influence, uh, and the, the combination, I should say, of the moon and the sun's influence on earth uh, changes by 25%, so that's a big fraction, every month, mm. right? So any alignment of planets is totally and completely washed out by the gigantic variation of gravity that the moon has on us every month for the last four and a half billion years. So, again, we clearly wouldn't expect anything. Uh, think, yeah. I have a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, what does this say? Where are the planets? Is, are they where the names are? They're where the names are, yeah. This is an image that's actually drawn to scale, which means you can't see the planets. So, but they're names at their locations. And the, the lines are indicating where they are. So, they, they're dim where they were in their orbit. And this is kind of their direction of motion. So, Uranus is there. Up there. This is an image, this is a picture basically of the solar system looking down on it from the north. I'm curious why they could never all line up. Um, one of the things that happens in, a, in the formation of a solar system is you initially have a disk full of material, stuff starts gathering together, and then you get little gravitational tugs that are starting to happen on these um, new bodies that are forming. If they ever get too close, one of the tugs will probably throw it into an orbit which makes it go close to another big object like the sun. If it gets too close to the sun, it's probably going to crash into the sun, or it'll get flung out. So over time, you end up with these what are called resonances, where you basically have planets that are kind of in nice places where they can't have much of a gravitational effect on each other anymore. And you also have them end up in, 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 a, in a resonance such that they won't be in the same place at the same time um, to tug on each other, because if it had happened in the very past, it probably would have destabilized the orbit, the orbit would have decayed, and that planet would be gone now. So the planets you're left with are kind of naturally in this resonance where they don't end up lined up like that. There could be um, little, t I mean, it's mostly, Jupiter is the only one that anyone would ever worry about. So you see the resonance really strongly with um, Jupiter and um, I guess probably with, well, I think Mars is the closest one to Jupiter. You actually do see it with Neptune and Pluto. That's probably the best example of this resonance. Neptune and Pluto never get close to each other because otherwise Pluto would be gone. Yeah. Yeah, you have your sun line. That would be about, I think I, I forgot the number, I calculated it, it's somewhere around 30 to 50 million years, it's a long time. Um, it, it, the only way you can get that happening is at a certain point in the sun's orbit around the galaxy. And uh, the sun's orbit around the galaxy takes 250 million years, and we're a significant fraction away from the point where we could actually ever see that happen. That also wouldn't have any gravitational effect on us. The center of the galaxy is gravitationally gigantic, however, it's super far away. So the sun is way more important. I think it's like 300 million times the uh, gravitational influence of the center of the galaxy just because of its proximity. Now, there are some alignments actually worth checking out. Uh, in fact, in 10 days, we'll have an eclipse of the sun that will be visible here in the Bay Area. Um, it's called an annular eclipse because the sun, or the moon, is a little smaller than it is on average. And so when it moves in front of the sun, it doesn't cover it completely and it leaves a ring. Now, actually, in the Bay Area, you won't see the full ring effect. Um, you'll only see um, most of the sun covered up. About 80% of the sun will get covered up here in the Bay Area. If you want to see the full ring effect, you have to go up. Um, north toward Redding or Shasta or Reno, Tahoe area, and then you can see the, the rain effect. That's May 20th. It's late afternoon, about 6.30 in the afternoon is when you'll be able to see that. And you actually do need to actually watch for it. Because the sun doesn't get completely covered up, it won't get very dark. That teeny little ring of sun is actually still enough sunlight to keep the, the daylights pretty high. Um, it'll kind of get as dark as when a cloud passes over the sun. 
So the only thing that might seem weird about it is if it happens to be a cloudless day, and then all of a sudden it gets kind of dark out. <laughs> you should check out shadows, especially. Shadows are really cool when this event occurs because they'll all be kind of doubled mm -hmm. because sunlight is coming from different angles. There's uh, eclipses are pretty common on Earth. They're not terribly common in any place on Earth, but somewhere on Earth, and on average, there's like four eclipses a year. So there's going to be a few other eclipses of the moon or of the sun by the moon this year. But this is special in that it's happening here uh, in our neck of the woods. So actually, here's a graph to show you where you want to go if you want to see the cool effect. Anywhere inside the blue lines, we'll see the total ring effect. If you're right on the red line, you'll see the moon directly in the center. But everywhere in California, it's going to see about 80% of the sun covered. There's also, a month later, actually there's only a few weeks later than that, Another cool alignment, which is when Venus will move in front of the sun. And it's kind of like an eclipse, except Venus is way too small. So it's just a teeny little silhouette of, uh, and it's right down where my cursor's not showing up, so let's walk over there. So in this picture, this happened in 2004, and there's Venus. We call that the transit of Venus, when it moves in front of the, the sun. And uh, these events happen in little eight-year pairs. So we had one in 2004, then we have another in 2012, and then they have a big gap of over 100 years. So the next one won't occur until 2117. So if you're going to watch a Venus transit in your life and you miss the last one, don't miss this one. It'll happen June 5th, and um, it'll be occurring um, at sunset, actually, here in the Bay Area. There's lots of places that are planning uh, viewing events you can go to Chabot Space and Science Center. I think Lawrence Hall of Science will have some. All right, let's look at some of the uh, more disaster-y type scenarios, the things that maybe those alignments would cause. One of them, and I'm going to go through these kind of fast, is uh, global warming. The idea is that, well, how many of you saw the movie The World, uh, you know, The Day After Tomorrow? A few of you. The idea of the day after tomorrow was global warming happens, and it happens all inside of like two weeks. You know, it was kind of crazy. The um, North Atlantic current shuts down. There's sudden freezing in the in the north. Superstorms kick up, and they bring cold air from the upper atmosphere down and freeze New York solid. It's all you know madness. Well, and and these are some of the ideas that you hear about doomsday scenarios that. That, that global warming will come, there'll be this like runaway effect that will happen all at once in 2012 and we'll have flooding and storms and everything. Well, I mean, the thing about global warming is that it's a slow effect, right? So that's, people are worried about global warming, and rightfully so, and so you hear there's that, that little bit of truth in it, right? There is global warming occurring. But the thing that people sometimes don't realize is that global warming is a slow crawl. It's a slow effect. It's a change that happens over decades. And um, so we wouldn't expect any kind of disaster that would occur overnight or even inside of a single year. You know, the effects that we're going to see are over human lifetimes, which is often one of the problems that um, scientists have trying to communicate about global warming to people and make them concerned about it. Because in their own lifetimes, you know, it's a little bit of a change. Excuse me. Yes. The same thing could be said about nuclear in Japan, a slow death, but it's shortened. I'm not sure I followed that. No, it, it takes it take time. It, it's not here today. It's, in other words, being exposed to too much radiation. Oh, the radiation poisoning. I see, I see. Yeah, you don't, unless it's an instantaneous lethal dose, you don't necessarily notice the effects until it's built up over time. I, okay. Related to this idea is that the idea that weather has been getting worse, right? That for some reason we have more and more storms, and it's just getting worse and worse and worse, and in 2012, that's going to be the end of it. There's going to be hurricanes galore, tornadoes everywhere, lightning, you name it, cats and dogs, rain from the sky. Um, but if we actually look at data, so this is the thing, our perceptions are always fooling us. 
I actually heard the weatherman mention this a couple weeks ago. We had some rain here in the Bay Area, mm. and everyone's like, oh my god, it's raining again. It's raining. Oh, it's so terrible. We never get so much rain. <laughs> and he's like, boy, people have such short-term memory. weather memory, right? I mean, first of all, it was raining the week before. <laughs> <laughs> and we went those whole few months where it wasn't raining, and everyone's complaining, oh, it's not raining. This is so bad. And we really do just have short-term weather memory. We don't seem to remember what the weather is like on an annual basis. And so you actually have to look at data look at see, and look and see, are there trends? Are there actual trends? And, and if you do that, you'll find that at least in one of the problems that you'll, you'll start to notice is if you do that, there's a signal that you'll see in the data that's a result of our increased ability to detect weather. Right? We have more satellites, we have more um, weather monitoring stations now, and we keep getting more every year, and therefore we see more but that doesn't necessarily mean that there is more bad weather. So you kind of have to look at least in the short term and say, well, over the last decade, for example, has there been a change? And there hasn't. There hasn't been really any significant change. There's some um, small in, uh, indications that maybe tropical cyclones, which we know as hurricanes, um, that they may not be so much uh, increasing in number, but perhaps in intensity, that we're seeing more big storms now than we were, say, 30 years ago. Um, but I'm going to just quickly jump through a sequence of uh, maps here that run from 2000 through 2011, and they show extreme weather events in the United States. Um, green is hail storms, blue is, um, I think, strong downpour rain, so very, very heavy rain storms, and red are tornadoes. So this is the year 2000. One of the things that's very fun about this map is what do you immediately notice about the geography? <laughs> For some reason, nature hates the east <laughs> and loves the west. What's going on there? What is that? There is, there is an element of that, but there's even something more that is, that is in the, there, but there's a reason for that. The Rocky Mountains. The Rocky Mountains. These are the Rocky Mountains right here that run through here. They actually have a huge influence on the weather of the continent. It's kind of amazing. They stir up the atmosphere as the atmosphere is moving across it and destabilize it. All right, so I'm going to skip through these and uh, see if you can notice any trends. Any trends? No. I mean, you will notice that, okay, one year there's a whole bunch of tornadoes here, but then the next year they're gone. And then one year there's a whole lot of um, hail here, the next year they're gone. And that's the kind of thing you have to look at these, you know, long term things. In one year you might have something bad, but the next year you don't. And over time you look at the average and see if there's any trends away from the average. And that's what we don't see. We don't see any trends. Now we do expect them over time, we will start to see them as a result of global warming, but within the small window of time we're looking at, we don't see that. And so we shouldn't expect that 2012 is going to be some kind of disastrous year for storms. There will be storms, and there have been storms already in 2012, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the things that, you know, I don't want to be out there debunking for these, these disaster scenarios, because storms do happen, and it's smart to be ready for them, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if you live in a tornado zone, tornado prone area, you should have, you know, an emergency plan in place for tornadoes. Not saying that one's going to happen particularly to you on December 21st, 2012, but I'll bet somewhere in the world there's going to be a tornado on December 21st, 2012. <laughs> same can be said with earthquakes. Um, the disaster scenario is the same, global earthquakes cause global disaster. Um, but earthquakes are a normal part of this planet. The crust is broken up into these plates that are constant motion, and there is basically an earthquake happening all the time somewhere along those plate boundaries. Um, they're illustrated in this map. There's an average, actually, of about one major earthquake every year. 
by major, I mean 8.0 or bigger. Mm. Um, and that's kind of an average. You know, if there are two or three in a year, that doesn't mean, oh, that average is wrong. It just means if you look over time, there's going to be some years where there are zero. <coughs> but that's been kind of right. You know, we had actually a big one happen just um, a month ago over here on the same spot that it happened back in 2004. <laughs> Of course, last year there was the giant one in Japan. The year before there was a rather major one in Chile. And uh, so it goes. There are no really trends of increasing amounts of tectonic activity. You just look at the amount of tectonic activity over time and it, it's kind of constant. So will there be earthquakes in 2012? Well, there already have been. Actually, there have been some in Mexico. Of course, that makes the news and everyone's like, oh, 2012 and earthquakes in Mexico. You know, earthquakes in Mexico are not terribly common, especially where they happen. They happened along this plate right here, which is an active plate region. Same thing we said with volcanoes. Volcanoes occur basically in concert with uh, earthquakes. They happen along those same tectonic plate boundaries. And we look at them and we see there's about 56 volcanic eruptions somewhere on Earth every year. And um, expect there to be volcanic eruptions, as we're actually seeing the one near Mexico City is starting to get active. Um, some people worry about Yellowstone National Park, which uh, is a special kind of volcano. It's uh, a volcano which a gigantic pool of magma builds up underneath, um, basically in a uh, chamber in the crust. The top collapses into it, and you have this gigantic caldera of molten material that sends ash up into the atmosphere, and it's pretty disastrous, actually. So if, if Yellowstone were to ever go off in our lifetimes, that would actually be a major catastrophe for Earth. Or, well, at least for the United States, and, and probably for Earth, too, because there would be ash all across the planet. However, geologists who are studying Yellowstone have not seen any indication that there's any buildup of pressure that's unusual. And, you know, they've looked at the evidence from the past eruptions, and there, there's no evidence that there's any indication that So that's good. Meteors. Well, meteors do strike the Earth, although this level of destruction that's shown in this picture, the Earth hasn't seen this for hundreds of millions of years. Because that was a big rock there. Um, but we do get hit all the time by small pieces. Basically, you think of the solar system, think about a rock, and you hit it with a hammer, and you bust it into a bunch of pieces you get a few really big pieces and a whole bunch of small pieces. And that's kind of how the asteroids are in our solar system. A whole bunch of small pieces and a few big ones. So if we're going to get hit by asteroids or comets, we're going to get hit most often by little teeny pieces. And we do. We get hit by them all the time. There's an event, um, example of a um, three uh, meter object that we actually saw before it impacted the planet that's kind of unusual that we actually get a chance to see it before it runs in and forms a fireball. Um, and this one was predicted to actually land in Sudan, and that's where it landed, and we actually recovered um, a piece of it. 10 kilograms of that rock were recovered mm. in Sudan. It was the first um, piece, the, the first meteor ever observed in space first and then recovered on the ground. So those things happen all the time, like every month. Um, there have been larger Incidents like one that struck Tunguska, Russia in 1908. Um, it was pretty devastating. This was a large, uh, probably, um, comet that exploded in the atmosphere before it actually reached the ground. So it didn't leave a crater, but the explosion leveled the forest for 10 kilometers in any direction. So it was an enormous explosion. Um, if anybody had lived there, they would not, they would not be alive. <laughs> But the, 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 you know, the kind of lucky thing about this event, nobody lived in that part of the sub area. And in fact, nobody even visited this site for 10 years. It wasn't until 1918 that somebody actually went there, saw the devastation, and took pictures of it. Mm -hmm. Question? Yeah, even, um, even though you can maybe scientifically prove that nothing's going to happen, you know, based on Mayan predictions, could it be maybe they knew something that we don't, or maybe you don't, beyond the scientific fact? 
And what is the reason that something's going to happen? Well, I'll, so I'll answer your question honestly, which was, you know, could there be something that couldn't be proved scientifically? The answer is yes. But I'm a scientist, so what am I going to tell you? I'm going to tell you about science, right? I, I'm not going to stand up and tell you about something that I can't back up. But is their prediction definitely based on the, their calendar, or was it? As, as we were talking about before, the Maya had no prediction. I mean, there was, there's no prediction about this year. They didn't, you know, all we have is a broken monument that maybe is, is talking about a celebration. And that's, that's all we know that they, they had to say about it. So could they have known more? Could they have thought more? Sure. Do we know what they thought? They have no idea. Um, well, depending on what part of the Earth cloud it can take, tens of thousands to millions of years to actually fall into the Earth cloud, which is the distribution of material around our sun of icy objects that are kind of leftover remnants of the formation of the solar system. And there's always a possibility of those unseen comets coming in. Um, the best we can do is try to track the ones that we can see and figure out their probability of impact over time. And we do that. JPL has a um, list of known asteroids and their risks. You can check out the URL and see what the known risks are. The good news is that everything we know about, we're safe from. Are there things out there that we don't know about? Sure. Um, our best guess, uh, and it's getting better every day, is that we know about 90% of all of the potentially hazardous asteroids out there. So that means, you know, we can say with about 90% confidence that we're safe for the foreseeable future. So there's, you know, that 10% of uh, uncertainty of disaster. The ones that, uh, well, it depends on their size. Uh, size is the actual importance for disaster. Um, so the ones that we're talking about that hit Russia, for example, that was 20 to 30 to meter. That would have been a regional devastation. You know, if it had happened over a populated area, it would have been devastating. It happened over an unpopulated area, not so devastating. They happen kind of frequently, probably in every 50 to 100 years. And you might ask, well, why have we not heard more about these events? You have to actually look back at the surface of the planet. It's mostly covered in water. Right? Okay. So the highest probability of impact is in water, where nobody lives. So over all of human history, we maybe have only ever heard about one of these events because in all of human history, most of the impacts have impacted where nobody lives and didn't know about it. The bigger impacts are even less frequent and more devastating. So that's kind of the, the, the ratio there. The more devastating, the less frequent they are. The most devastating one that we know about in um, recent geological history, recent, 65 million years ago, in Mexico, actually, in the Mayans, in Chichibu, uh, Mexico, was the impact that we think did in the dinosaurs. And that was an enormous and globally catastrophic event. If something were, like, were, were to happen like that now, that would be terrible. And so that's where, you know, there's a bit of, there is a bit of danger. There's a 10% chance of disaster in the uh, asteroid scenario. But you know, 10% chance of disaster is actually kind of low considering the risk you take when you get in your car every day, <laughs> which is actually much higher risk. <laughs> so you always have to weigh those risks. Um, magnetic pole shift, that's another fascinating one. You hear this story that the magnetic pole of the planet is going to somehow shift. Or actually what they say is the pole of the planet is going to shift. Um, and they kind of mix up, do you mean the magnetic pole or the geographic pole? Because mm -hmm. the geographic pole, that's kind of impossible for that to shift, because that means the planet has to suddenly start spinning a different way. And that's not going to happen. Um, but the magnetic poles do shift with, 
I wouldn't say regularity, but um, with, free, uh, with frequency. Um, on the uh, right of the picture here is an indication of, geograph of magnetic polarity of the planet with geographic time, so millions of years ago, a number is reading down. So it goes back to 155 million years ago. And you can see that there have been flips in polarity again and again, although they're not very regular. And there have been huge periods of time where there were no flips. Um, we actually think that there's the possibility that we're heading into a flip now. We've actually seen the motion of Earth's north magnetic pole start to accelerate. Though we have no, we have, since we weren't around the last time it flipped, we don't really know if that is actually an indication of flip. But one of the things that we do know from this record is that when they do flip, it takes a long time, like probably 10,000 years for a flip to occur. So it's not an instantaneous thing. And if you want to ask, what's the danger to us? Well, it's been happening throughout Earth's history. Clearly, life has been fine. So we wouldn't really expect there to be any disastrous effect of magnetic pole flip. You hear people talking about, oh, your, your hard drives are going to get wiped out. All your data is going to disappear. <laughs> That's horrible. Well, you know, we could, we could lose all of our money if that happened, because it's all electronic now. Okay. But the magnetic field of the Earth is extremely ordinarily weak compared to the magnetic field of a hard drive. So the flipping of the magnetic field of the Earth is not going to do anything to your hard drive. Your hard drive has no idea that there's a magnetic field around the Earth. It takes a really significant magnet to erase your hard drive. Alright, so I said all those words. Solar storms. So the idea is that the sun is going to send off one of these gigantic storms and it's going to knock us out. Um, the sun does send out storms. In fact, there was one today. Because um, there's a really cool um, sunspot cluster that's huge on the sun. You can actually see it without the aid of a telescope as long as you have an appropriate filter to look through. Um, but the, uh, these kind of storms happen with a, a, a periodicity. So there's periods where we have a lot of storms and then periods where we don't have a lot of storms. And it's about a 11-year cycle between maximum to maximum or minimum to minimum. And we've been actually tracking it uh, for 400 years. That's the graph on the bottom there. It's the graph of the number of sunspots which correlate with uh, the storms. The storms actually originate from the sunspots. Um, there was this weird 50-year period where the sunspots disappeared. Huh. Solar scientists are really keen to understand that because that's kind of a fascinating what, what happened on the sun. Is that normal? I mean, we've only been watching it for 400 years. The sun's 5 billion years old. You know, does that happen? Like, you know, with some kind of other period of time that we're unaware, unaware of? There's some scientists who are really excited, hoping that it will happen soon, because they really like to, they like, they like to be able to study that. You know? um, these storms, so these storms happen all the time. And they don't really have any effect on uh, life on Earth. They can affect our technology. So the only reason we've ever become aware of them now is because we have satellites in space that can be affected by these storms. And we have astronauts who are working up there who can get into dangerous situations. We have flights that fly over poles that can have increased radiation during these events. So now that we have a technological society, we do have to be aware of these storms. But um, the risk of storms in 2012 is actually much lower than any of the previous cycles we've seen. Right now, the prediction for this cycle is to be the weakest in over 100 years. And the peak of it is not even going to happen in 2012. It's going to happen next year. So, you know, those who want to insist that, oh, it's correlating with the solar cycle. Well, not so much. Plus, the biggest storms that the sun puts out usually happen on the downslope of this uh, trend. So they usually happen as the sun is quieting down is when you get the biggest storms. So that means that won't even happen until well after 2015. That will get some of the biggest storms of this cycle. But we'll get far fewer of them probably than we had even in the last cycle. And in the last cycle, we got by this fine. There was one blackout in 2003 in Norway. All right, Planet X is another one of the 
hear about. There's some mysterious planet out there. No one's seen it. It's going to come in through the solar system and wreak havoc. Maybe it'll even do this. Smash into us. That, by the way, is about what you need to change the spin of the planet. If you wanted to change our spin, you're going to have to knock into it with another planet. Um, this one, we can pretty definitively put to, put to rest. There's no hidden planet out there. We've had telescopes, actually, just recently, who surveyed the entire sky in infrared light. It only took them a year to do it. Actually, it took them six months to do it. But they, in a year, they did it twice. Any dark planet hiding from us would have been hugely bright in infrared light and saturated our detectors. Didn't see it. We can definitively say there's this object, this mystical object that's going to get it to not there. Uh, the periodic extinction rate of 65 million years. Um, that was actually re-examined in the 1990s. In the 1980s, there was an, uh, there was a thought that if you looked at the extinction events in the geological record, there was a periodicity to them, which some people thought, well, if you had a planet that orbited the sun with that period, that maybe when it was out in the Oort cloud of the comets, it could send comets in toward the, toward the um, inner solar system. But they re-examined that data in the 1990s and realized there was a, a statistical error in the analysis and the periodicity went away and there was no longer any reason to, to suspect. It's still possible that there's such an object that could, that could exist. And actually that mission that I was telling you about is called WISE that did the infrared survey some of the scientists are hoping to be able to kind of either confirm that there is such an object or basically put limits on the, on the ability of such a thing to be out there. But that's a lot harder to detect. I'm going to skip ahead for time to our last disaster and then I'll take some questions. Uh, on that 90% about the asteroid, the 10% the they can't predict, is it because they, they, they haven't catalyzed them all? That's or? right, because we haven't seen them. So, so, that, so that, that number would increasingly go up as we found more? As we found more, basically the risk decreases, right? Because the more we see, the more we can track and tell that they're not going to run into us, and so the overall risk decreases the more we know. And when we're not seeing it because they're small or because we're just looking in the wrong places? It's mostly because we're looking in the wrong places. We do have pretty good telescopes now to actually see even the small ones. Although it would help to have uh, certain other types, like this, this WISE, which I keep harping on only because I worked on it. The WISE telescope was an infrared telescope that actually surveyed asteroids along with the whole sky, and it was very good at finding them because it was looking in infrared, and dark asteroids can't hide from infrared. All right, the last disaster, which is uh, kind of the most energetic one, gamma ray bursts. This is like the, de the birth cry of a black hole. So there's two types of objects that can make a gamma ray burst. There's supermassive stars, the most massive stars in the, in the universe. When they die, they collapse. And as they're collapsing, their huge magnetic fields start shooting out these jets across the universe that are spewing gamma rays out to the universe. Um, and then a black hole forms in the core. Or you can have two dead stars called neutron stars that collide. And they do the same thing. They send this jet of material that shoots across the universe. These things we observe nowadays to occur about once a day in the universe. So somewhere in the universe, one of these things happens every day. So that's kind of the frequency of them. Now that seems like that's a lot, but the universe is huge. Right? So the universe has 100 billion galaxies in it. The chances of it happening in any one galaxy, like ours, are and you have, then you have to consider the time period. So take a year, the chances of happening in a galaxy in a year is about 1 in 270 million. Mm. Right? Your chances of winning the lottery are actually a lot better than that. <laughs> so if you're worried about gamma ray bursts, I'd play the lottery if I were you. <laughs> um, and not only do they have to happen, in order, they have to be close in order to be, to be dangerous. And they are pretty dangerous if they're close because the gamma rays can they can basically ionize the atmosphere, blow away all of the ozone. That's not so good for us. They would probably just um, irradiate. The, the burst of, of gamma rays only happens for like a, a fraction of a second. 
But the burst is so intense that it can do all this damage, and it would probably um, sterilize the side of the Earth that actually is facing the gamma ray burst at the time. Um, but the key is we'd, we'd have to be looking down that barrel. This thing would have to be pointed right at us. So even though it happens once per year in a galaxy somewhere in the universe, or sorry, once a day in a galaxy somewhere in the universe, if it were in our galaxy, in order to be dangerous to us, it still has to be pointed at us. So that even decreases the probability even further of danger. So, you know, they're real, and, you know, it's a possible danger. It could wipe us all out someday. But it's not very likely. And so that's kind of my, my general story, is that these, all these things you hear about, there, there are some semblance of reality to them, but the possibilities, of, or the probabilities of there being disaster in 2012 are low. And that's really what, sci you know, that's really what a scientist should tell you. I don't trust people who speak in certainties, in absolute certainty. Scientists should always tell you their error bars. 